So thank you, Toma, and thank you all of, all of the organizers for uh, for doing this. And it is a real, real pleasure to to be here and to to celebrate uh, Frank's uh, change of color in the in the hair, right, around the years. So as many of uh, you, I have also made the exercise to remember when we we met for uh, for, for the first time. It was in a it was at the Institute, really, of uh, Advanced Study. It was, um, well, I guess, uh, time flies many years ago. And um, I, I happened to go there because Carlos was, uh, Carlos Kenny was visiting uh, Jan Burgen, and Jan Burgen had invited also Frank. I guess uh, he wanted to learn about uh, Blow Up, and then why not uh, to invite Frank for that? Anyway, so it happened that he was there, and it was kind of... Um, very nice, nice period. Was, uh, with my two little kids, it was of course a very, very nice and familiar. <coughs> Bilham was there also, by the way. And uh, so it was kind of a, a reduced group. It was not the kind of program that you have so many people around. That at some point uh, there are so many things happening that uh, it's, it's hard to speak to anybody. But we had the, so it's just the, the three of us. Bilhan was around. I guess you would also appear uh, or was visiting. I don't remember. <coughs> and and uh, so we we talk a lot. And the memory I have of myself of that time is that definitely I was a, a what I would call a linear guy. And uh, Frank, of course, was uh, a non-linear guy. Uh, but anyway, we we were managed uh, to talk. I don't know in what language because our. English is kind of peculiar in our conversations. I always had the feeling that when Rebecca, his wife, listened to us, said, come on, what? <laughs> what are these people saying? But anyway, so, um, so yeah, we talk a lot, and I guess we are still talking, right, Frank? And uh, there's many years after, and so far, so good. So <clears throat> anyway, I hope I move a little bit, not too much, from this... Uh, uh, a statement of being a linear guy. And uh, also, um, I have the opportunity, I mean, this was uh, really a time of celebration, so you can use uh, big words or strong words. So I, well, I was uh, brave enough. I mean, if I have to give a talk on Frank's uh, birthday, I have a, uh, I should speak about this if I can, or at least I should be allowed to, to use these words. So it is not clear. <coughs> Uh, what is the meaning of uh, a blow up here, but it's part of the talk. And of course, probably you, you will wonder how is it possible to put all this thing together, blow up and, and 1D cubic and less, but this is part of the talk. And also, and just to finish this slide, this, it is not just by myself, but uh, part of uh, uh, the talk is, is also a survey of uh, things we have been doing along the years. And, in all this business, Valeria Vanica, who is in the audience also, is uh, playing a fundamental role. Okay, <clears throat> so let's let's move forward. This uh, I have kind of a summary, and the starting of the summary is uh, the one D cubic NLS. It could be with a plus or with a minus. Uh, and, but uh, uh, interestingly, they are not a small solutions. But in any case, we can do it for either plus or minus, and they are not, uh, uh, they are rough solutions. Anyway. So the, 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 the main part of the talk, of you want the main new thing, is this theorem with uh, Valeria, Renato, Luca, and Nikolai Svetkov that uh, we uploaded in the in archive like uh, one month ago. In fact, uh, this was just after my visit uh, to, to Paris. This, uh, I have become kind of a religious person, and, and one of my first commandments is to visit Paris at least one month a year since I, I met this guy and try to keep this uh, uh, as, as, as much as possible. And I really want to use this opportunity not just to thank Frank, but also the community uh, around Frank and, and in Paris, because for me, it has been really a before and after. Eh? Yeah. All these things I'm going to talk to talk about. It couldn't have been possible if I wouldn't have been invited by different people, different departments in 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 this city. In particular, one of the departments was this one, Sergey, 
and by the way, by Frank. Anyway, so <clears throat> this is, uh, as I said, uh, we put it in the, in the archive uh, not so long ago. And this is uh, the statement. So imagine I'm telling you the data time one, and I'm saying that if I multiply the data by dc to the minus i square i x square over 4, then what I get is kind of a nice 4 times p periodic function. And I assume h stands for the solar space, and 0 plus means that I assume just epsilon derivatives in L2, right? Then the solution blows up at t equals 0. Of course, this one here and this one quarter are related, as you will see in the proof. This is uh, one possible way of uh, describing the result. Another possible way could be, let's assume that uh, now I'm giving you the information in, in the Fourier side. So what I say is that the Fourier transform of the, uh, say, the, the, the your solution at time one multiplied now by e to the ic square. And again, this plus here, this one here, and this one are related. Now, because uh, you see, uh, you are using the Fourier transform, so there is these changes of 2 pi, 4 pi, depending also on, on the definition. Uh, you, if you put a one half there, then your life could be easier. <clears throat> so the result is that if I do that, then uh, uh, I am claiming that this is a 2 pi periodic function. And again, I am assuming epsilon derivatives in L2, then the solution blows up at t equals 0. And uh, this is, uh, the, say, the first part of the talk. And the second part of the talk will be mainly things that uh, uh, we already, already knew how to prove, and this was uh, with Valeria, that uh, never, nevertheless, the U can be continued for negative time as a geometric solution. And of course, you have a lot of uh, quotations in here. And the, the talk is really to try to explain what I, do I mean by these uh, words? Here, here, and, and here. And the reason why I'm going from 1 to 0 is because uh, we have already done the other way around, which is to start at 0 with Valeria and go up to 1. And uh, in a sense, uh, from once you know that is, you can do it, it is easier from an analytical point of view. At least uh, what matters with regarding the cubic NLS but really, the difficulty there is uh, the, uh, the geometric part. But uh, you, when <coughs> you construct the solution from 1 to 0, then the geometric part is essentially the same. So really, the new thing is that you can go from 1 to 0. So this is the summary. And uh, as I said, I, am, I guess I am allowed to use uh, beautiful words. And if you learn something from these blow-up people, is that you have to look for say, uh, universal, right, uh, profiles. So, or uh, like solitons or things like that, that uh, can tell you what is, how things are blowing up or whatsoever. So I wonder if the, these two examples are universal from any kind of point of view. The first one, I'm pretty sure of, of it. The second one, it is uh, not so clear, although I think it is. So the first one is very easy. It is, I call it, you give me a parameter A, which is a real number. And uh, this is a, 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 a function of x and t. And what I claim is this is a solution of, um, of uh, cubic NLS, of the, the equation I wrote in the previous slide. And uh, now if I try to understand it in terms of uh, the statement of the theorem, what happens is that I pass this guy here, and of course, the log of 1 is 0. So this is essentially is nothing but a, but a constant, which is your uh, free parameter. And then the conclusion is that uh, first, uh, uh, you could think that you are dealing with uh, some kind of self-similar solution. And it's almost true. There is a, a correction of the phase, which is due to the rotation invariance of the equation that uh, Daniel uh, insisted a lot in his talk. But uh, it is not uh, uh, um, self-similar, but it's almost self-similar. So, and then, of course, the, the, the other conclusion is that uh, this blows up in which sense? That, uh, well, there is no, you cannot define the solution at time zero. Why? Because uh, when you pass the, this, this, uh, uh, this correction of the phase to the left, then you obtain the limit. 
So because this has a limit and this has, does not have a limit, then uh, the, the solution cannot have a limit. So as simple as that. So you want, this is my first notion that uh, uh, something is going on at, at, at time zero. This was an observation that uh, Carlos Kenny Gustavo Ponce and myself did a long time ago. And it was more, more than uh, related to the, to the scalings. It was related to another group of symmetries of cubic NLS, which is very important, which is the so-called Galilean invariance or Galilean symmetry where that will appear in, in a minute. So this is the very first simple example. But uh, I want to convince you that this is uh, this example matters, and and then I uh, and I have to recall some very old and relevant result by uh, Toru Osawa about the scattering of uh, one D cubic NLS. That as all we know that it is uh, it was really very true because it was an open question for quite some time, and the reason was that it was not the usual scattering; it has to be long range. And uh, you can reformulate it as follows. You can start as, uh, with as a profile as good as you want. And then you build up this guy, the, which is very similar to my first example, except that you have this, this amplitude and it depends on your profile f. And then what, you, what Othawa did was to construct solutions of this problem such that uh, you have an error and the error goes to zero in an appropriate topology when t goes to infinity. But of course, another of the symmetries of cubic NLS is the, the scaling. So you can now play a little bit with the scaling and say, instead of uh, starting with just with F, let's start with F lambda of C. The reason, I'm sorry, the reason, the reason why I'm uh, using Psi here, which is X over T, is because really this is really more on the, in, at the free level and the uh, uh, classical uh, linear uh, uh, Schrodinger equation. This guy is really the Fourier transform of the, of the initial condition. So that's the reason why I'm calling this L. So now try to do the same in L, in lambda. Now you have a family of solutions. And at least formally, this, this, uh, this family of solutions converges really to epsilon A. And A is nothing but uh, <clears throat> F of zero. That really I prefer to understand it as the integral of the anti-Fourier transform of F. OK, so. It does, and really, this is the scattering behavior of a, of a nice solution at time zero. So it doesn't matter what is the functional setting you start with, that if you want to construct things that are, say, well behaved with respect to scaling, you leave the class. Because EA is, uh, has no decay at infinity. All right? This is the property. This is, this is also very, very clear, for example, in modified KDB, which is like a, a sister equation of uh, Cubic anyway, so from this point of view, I, I, I claim this DCR is, um, is a, 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 rele a relevant uh, solution. And it is non perturbative, as Daniel insisted the other day, because really uh, it is the solution of, uh, of a nonlinear OD, which is this one. And it will be pretty clear in a minute why this is the right hand side. As you see, there is no Laplacian here, the Laplacian has been erased. But, but on the other hand, you have a 1 over t that comes from somewhere, all right? And then you have to deal with this guy. This is a nonlinear guy. The only thing that uh, modifies is the phase, not the amplitude, but uh, it is there. All right, so now the second example is much, uh, in a sense, is much more weird. Now I call it D, and D is standing for Dirac, from the Dirac uh, comb, right? not for. And <clears throat> OK, so this CM is just a constant. M eventually will have a meaning, a geometrical meaning, which is the number of sides of a regular polygon. But that's, uh, you can imagine, it's just a constant. And then what I have here is nothing but uh, 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 just a Fourier series, which, of course, is very, uh, relate, very much related to the uh, free evolution. And now what I have to, to tell you is that uh, this will be kind of, a, as before, is a solution of the, of the uh, a constant coefficient uh, linear uh, Schrodinger equation, but I have to modify it in order to, to fit with the nonlinearity. So now what is the, the, the change of phase? It is, you have, as before, the logarithmic correction with the amplitude to the square, but now you have a completely new guy. And you have this, uh, this, this uh, R of M that uh, will be clear in a minute uh, 
what is the meaning of that? Observe that you are summing in the non-rational set, which is typically called in this setting, which m is different from zero, so you really can integrate there in time and to obtain an asymptotic expansion of, of this phase in terms of powers of negative powers of t. So now <coughs> that this is a solution in a sense, uh, of course, uh, this is very weird because uh, you, there, is no main, there is no notion of uh, computing the absolute value square of this guy. Uh, there is uh, no way of uh, speaking about that, so you have to make meaning of uh, what you mean by this bit solving the, the cubic NLS. So uh, it's just uh, 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 the existence of a solution. This is something that uh, we did, Valeria and I, with with Bravin, and it was uh, one year ago, I guess, or two years ago. So then uh, the next computation I need you to pay attention to is simple, but it is important, which is the Poisson's omission formula, right? So Poisson's omission formula tells you that you can, instead of if you put <coughs> deltas, this is the Dirac comb, that's the reason of the D. So what is the Fourier transform of this guy? It's nothing but uh, this with T equals zero. So now, uh, to add in these uh, frequencies, the only thing you have to do is to, to look at the uh, free evolution. So if you go from right to left, you, I guess you agree that this is, this is true. But uh, uh, I'm sorry, but the next three lines are kind of, of important. <laughs> so now you can say, what, what is the solution? We know what is the solution. Uh, this is the free evolution. This is the delta. So this is the fundamental solution, just translated in J. So you write it, and <coughs> this is it. Okay, and now you make the expansion of the square, and this is what you obtain, right? So you obtain something which is very reminiscent of the, e, uh, the, the first example, right? It's nothing by the fundamental solution of one delta, and you uh, essentially obtain something very similar to that, but uh, now, uh, well, it is at this uh, location, x over 2t, and the frequency is now 1 over 40. Right, this is the version of the, of the conformal transformation at the free level. So anyway, so the, the, the conclusion is that if I look at time one and don't pay too, ma too much attention at four pi, two pi and whatever, because quite likely they are not correct. So let's assume that uh, two pi is one. So essentially what I have on the left is that uh, is at a given time. So I assume this is one and I am rescaling. And I am saying, what is the solution? So at time one is uh, just uh, this guy, that of course is uh, is periodic, but it is uh, quite rough. Huh? So it is not. Um, it is a distribution. That's what it is. So <clears throat> what we claim is that uh, then the, this, the, the the what I wrote in the first uh, line is is a solution. So I guess that I need to tell you what is this this. Uh, uh, R of M, and by this eventually it will be the cardinality. So this is the cardinality of a set that measures the, the resonance set that because you are in 1D cubic analysis is extremely simple. But that doesn't mean that the, the arithmetic function that is behind that is, is not important. So let's, let's, let's try to, to, to play a, a, a small modification of the previous game. The previous game was I put uh, deltas in the in the, in the integers, right, I, I look at the free evolution, and now I put, in, instead of the coefficient 1, I put uh, a general coefficient, a, j, that the, there is no reason why it's going to be uh, constant, so it has to depend on time. And I know from the very first example that I have to uh, make a modification of the phase because otherwise I will not be able to find the solution, right? So that this answer uh, so simple uh, is nice and gives you some, some game, it's, uh, which is a very simple idea, is due to, to Kita, huh? that I forgot to, to mention in the slide. So anyway, so now we, uh, we reproduce uh, uh, what we were doing and the conjecture, and this is what I'm now is more or less telling you how you go from time zero to time one, right? So you say, let's assume that AJ are given by, uh, capital AJ are given by some, uh, say, let's, let us call it Fourier coefficients, and I look for a solution in a perturbative way where uh, RJ of T goes to zero. So, <clears throat> and uh, I know that uh, this should be the answers. 
or this should be called you want the right gauge. Anyway, so <clears throat> then because of uh, pre precisely previous computation I, I had done in the uh, and in the, the computation I had done in the previous slide, it turns out that is if you is your unknown, it's much better to look at uh, what is called the conformal transformation of the U that behaves uh, it essentially this is the lens transformation that uh, <coughs> that Nicola was uh, uh, using before, but when you don't have the harmonic oscillator, so it's something that happens at the free level. And now what is the equation? I, U is the solution of cubic NLS, and you wonder what is the equation for this new unknown V. And this is, was precisely in the previous talk, and it, it, and, and it is the same as before, but with uh, now it is non-autonomous. You have, you have the one over T that appear in the first of the I, I, I wrote in the second slide of the of the talk. So, in a few words, I want to find solutions of this type, and the way of constructing them is instead of working with the U, I work with the conformal transformation. I do the computations, and I end up with another cubic NLS, which is essentially the same except that uh, it is non-autonomous. I have the one over t that, of course, is non-integrable, and it is, uh, uh, and that's the reason why these logs appear. And also, I'm changing time. So what was uh, t between zero and one now is becoming t between one and infinity, right? So, but imagine that tau is in between one and two. You say, come on, uh, then the v is going to be periodic. That's, uh, and then you are looking for solutions on the v. So quite likely you are. You are in business, and this is uh, what happens. So <clears throat> you um, now you are say you call Burgen and say what uh, what he did, and what he did was essentially this. He looks for a solution of this problem in this way and renormalized with respect to the the phase you expect to be the right one, and you end up in a in an ODE system for the coefficients b j of tau. And what, are the, what is the relation between this bj of tau and the aj? It's very simple. It's just this one. Okay? So, yes? The equation depends on aj? This equation? Yes. In this aj square. Because this aj is given. Yes, but the sum is over j, so... No, it does not depend on j. Because when you do all this together, what you end up is something which is periodic, right? So I am. This is the way I am writing it. Is this the question? Ah, the sum. The sum. I'm sorry. The sum is in J. Yeah. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, the sum is in J. This is nothing but a, a Fourier series, but uh, of course uh, this is what Burgen did, right? You put your Fourier coefficient depending on time. And try to to solve for this new Fourier coefficient. I think the question was in the third line from the bottom. The third line, this one. Yeah, but you have to sum in J. No, no, no. Sorry, this is. I'm sorry. <laughs> this is wrong. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So this is uh, this is what what is what you have to put here. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it is. Uh, it is a fun. I'm sorry. It, yeah, you are completely right. Sorry about that. Yeah. I guess too many years. So instead of aj of t put, um, instead of aj, you have to put some a of t. A, a of t, OK? And you really, this part of the business, what is what you have to put here? So it will be clear in a minute what I mean by this idea. Sorry. I guess it was too much uh, copy paste. So, well, anyway, so this is the, the OD system you finish with, right? And, and of course, uh, so it is a cubic NLS. You plug your Fourier series, you, and you end up with a, 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 an OD system for each Fourier coefficient, coefficient. And this is the J. OK, I'm sorry. So now that you fix the, uh, you, you want to compute what is the, the, the dynamics, I mean, the ODE of the J Fourier coefficient, then this is the guy you have to put here, and it's because of the cor logarithmic correction of the phase I, I wrote. OK? Is it clear now? Good. So, well, and then you, you uh, so now, uh, of course, I have clarified the 1 over t, and this is the reason of the log correction of the phase, because you really want to kill uh, this guy at zero, 
Otherwise, you have a problem. And of course, this is not a new idea. In fact, it's a new idea. As far as I, the first time I saw it was with Gurgen again, trying to solve these kind of problems, in, not in the 1D case, but in the higher. So then if, uh, because uh, you assume that bj at, uh, 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 at time zero, at yeah, time one, in this, at time infinity in this case, is going to be aj squared. So this goes to zero at time infinity with a power rate that I will allow you to integrate in, in time. All right? So this is it. So now, finally, what is the, uh, and, and of course, these are the, the frequencies that appears because you have the log of t and you have the, the, you have the bj here and you have the, the three other guys. And then this comes with uh, this particular expression. And now, what is the RM? The RM is uh, that, uh, uh, remember that I started with J1, J2, J3. So this M is uh, the difference, the corresponding difference of the squares. So you factorize. And this is the resonance set, which is, uh, has a very simple expression in, uh, in the 1D case. But uh, it's better to write it this way. You, you have given an integer that is written as, in fact, it's an even integer. And now for all the uh, pairs that this thing happens, then uh, you, have, uh, you have to sum in this RM. So really, in the case, in the example two, the BJs are a constant, right? The BJs are a constant. And then what you count is just uh, the cardinality of this guy which is the, the number, essentially the number of divisors of M, which is an arithmetic simple function, but uh, that really the behavior, the, 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 the behavior of M is, uh, is complex. So <clears throat> then this is the second example. So the second example is in the pre, if I put all the BJs to be a constant, then I, I can uh, reduce it to a finite system that the only thing I have to do is to, to, to do the corresponding integral in time of 1 over t of this series. That was the, the reason of this, this fact. So the theorem we prove is first goes from, uh, the statement of the theorem, what says is that we go from 1 to 0. So I don't fix a priori the fj's, right? I don't know what, which these guys are. And secondly, that, uh, well, I assume that not all the Fourier coefficients are identically. Neither they are identically, there is only one, which is the first example, one, zero. Neither it is the second example, which are all the uh, Fourier coefficients are the same, equal to a constant, right? So I want to do something in between. And uh, what I assume, and the, the theorem states that uh, I have a theorem as long as these AJs uh, are in L2 epsilon, a little L2 in this case, because I need these AJs are the Fourier coefficients, so H epsilon means that uh, they are in L2 against a, 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 an epsilon weight. All right, so this is the statement of the theorem. So <clears throat> in, in this case, of course, the value at one, it is precisely what I was saying. It is just the Fourier series that I renormalize with respect to the phase because it's much, much easier to give the dynamics of the Fourier coefficient when it is written in this, in this way. All right, so... <clears throat> Now, let me start to, to convince you that uh, this, there is some kind of blow up here. And uh, uh, this is uh, what I, I, try, I will try to explain in this slide. Because my functional setting is kind of uh, peculiar, let's put it this way. So I have the, the free evolution. And then, of course, uh, what we know is that if I use a Fourier uh, transform, then if I renormalize by the phase e to, in time one, i to the ic square, then Right, this guy is uh, is is not uh, it, it does not change in time, right? Because uh, all the f all the uh, modes are frozen by this uh, 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 phase. So if I renormalize the phase, nothing happens. And in particular, if I start with something which is periodic, right? So it's something like this. Then it will remain periodic. And in fact, all the Fourier coefficients are the same. All right. And uh, this is uh, uh, what we are starting with. I start uh, telling you that at time one, this is periodic. So what I expect is uh, to work with, uh, not with u, u hat, but with the corresponding renormalization of the phase. And the first question uh, is, uh, why is this going to be periodic? I mean, there is no reason that the periodicity of this guy will be stable uh, because of the nonlinearity. Well, it turns out that it is. And uh, essentially, this is our one of the few examples. If you try to do this in modified KDV, you definitely 
are dying. This does not happen. And there is a very simple way of convincing yourself. You write uh, the equation for the omega, that now will be an integral differential equation because you are in the Fourier side. But uh, you do, you write your, your guys in terms of the Fourier transform. And again, you have the difference of the squares that factorize as before. I did it before with the Fourier coefficients, but now I do it with the with psi, and, and, and it's exactly the same factorization. But definitely this is invariant under translations, right? So if I change C1, C2, and C3 by the same amount, this does not change at all. So if I start with something which is periodic, it's going to be periodic, right? And this is uh, really the, uh, the solutions, uh, the framework we construct. You, uh, I could tell you what is the similar uh, statement in the physical space, but I guess I'm getting out of time, so better if I rush a little bit, because otherwise I guess I will not tell many things. So this is the theorem. Okay, the theorem is that if I start uh, uh, with an initial condition at time one, right, that is uh, uh, after the multiplication by the right phase is, uh, uh, is uh, periodic, <coughs> then there exists a solution of the 1D cubic analyze that goes up infinite time in the following sense. If I start with this frame, this frame is broken at time zero. It remains in the continuous, I mean, the omega is still periodic. It remains in the HS for uh, the, the, the torus, but, uh, but it, this does not happen in T equals zero. It is not a, a question of size. Really, the, the size of the Fourier coefficients are the supreme one is, 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 remains the same. It's a question of the phases. So what we say is that the phase at time zero has this uh, logarithmic behavior, where now, of course, the difficulty is to find what is this number, what is the right choice you have to put in order to have a limit. Okay, and that's the reason why this way back from one to zero is more, more complicated, right? And, uh, uh, and this is it. This is my, my notion of law. I, I have a structure, and of course, the L2 norm is preserved, huh? because uh, this is very, it's not a question that I don't have a conservation law. I do have a conservation law which is the L2 norm in the period. So that means that the, the sum of the AJs square is something that remains uh, constant. It's a question that the, 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 the phase blows up at every AJ. And at the, at the uh, phase space is exactly, is exactly the same, except uh, <clears throat> that, uh, of course, this will go to the delta in X minus J, but it will not have a limit unless you put this logarithmic correction. Right? It's like I started with the you what? The modified Dirac com, I put not, uh, not the same weights in all the deltas, but these AJs. And unless I make this modification of the phase in each J, I will not have the limit. So this is the precise statement. OK, so hence the theorem, uh, uh, this is what I said before. This theorem, in a sense, in interpolates between the two examples. <coughs> You could wonder what happens if instead of the AJs being in little l2 uh, with uh, epsilon uh, weight, uh, it's in little lp. Quite likely there are things that you can do in this direction, but uh, at least with the smallness. If you want to avoid the smallness, you will have to work. And really, then the problem becomes uh, you start to have problems at the, in the geometric side. And of course, the interesting thing what, is what happens when p equals plus infinity. Probably that is too much. But there is a, a scenario within this setting that uh, maybe could be uh, affordable, but I will not speak about this. So now uh, this is, of course, a notation that at some point was familiar to me after talking to Frank. And uh, you, you want to obtain some, uh, some uh, blow up result, then you have to keep track. Uh, you be careful with the, the compact symmetries, so the non-compact symmetries, right? So which are the non-compact symmetries? Here are the translations in space and, and time, then you also have the Galilean invariance. But of course, uh, the translations in time I'm using to, to, to the determine what is the blow up time, right? So this is where the translation in time is, is, is used. Otherwise, uh, also including the scaling, I, I'm, I'm, I'm in a framework which is, uh, which is invariant by these symmetries. Of course, by translations, because uh, the equation itself is translation invariant, but also by the, the, the Galilean invariance, because I am describing my, my space precisely in Fourier side, and I'm saying it is L2 periodic, and also by scaling, 
because I'm starting with delta functions, if you want, at time zero, and these are scaling invariants. So <clears throat> this is one of the bonus of the of the result. Of course, I have to fix some setting, which is uh, this precise thing. And also notice that my condition in physical space is L2 log. I mean, I'm not shown assuming any kind of decay at infinity, although it's true that I'm fixing the, the structure, right? So it's an L2 log result. All right, so this is uh, so about the previous results. Of, of course, as you can imagine, the, uh, this is a very old problem. I started with Casenar, and I'm, I'm not writing the, the years because what likely uh, I would be wrong. So it's uh, by Casenar and Weisler, and Weisler is with two S, right? Then Dineber and Bello, and of course, Susumi for L2, Burgen for L2 in the periodic case. Then about this ill postness, uh, there was a first result by Carlos Kenny, Gustavo Ponce, and myself. And uh, this was for the focusing case, and uh, for the non-focusings and, and, and further was uh, extended by Chris, Colleander, and Tao. And, and there are many other important things in terms of the growth of sublime norms. I mean, there is a huge literature on this, and uh, as far as I know, these are the names. Then, uh, with respect to well postness, and S here stands for, for the Sobolev class. And it is the non is uh, the non homogeneous soul of class. This is I mean this is a hard problem, and uh, there was uh, first uh, uh, results by Koch and, and Tataru using, using the complete integrability, then uh, by Kilip, Bisan and Sang, and then by Harrop, Griffiths, Kilip and Bisan that go all the way up to minus one half, which is the critical exponent. So all these results are uh, subcritical, but of course the class is. I mean, it's huge, huh? it is the Sobolev class. Of course, it is not Galilean invariant, but in this regime, uh, Galilean invariance penalizes you. Huh? It's, uh, so it's something that you really have to deal with. So, and then, but then there is another possible setting that is much closer to, to the Fourier analysis point of view, which is to assume that, uh, that the Fourier transform lives in some LP, that uh, global in space, and of course this is translation invariant, and here the key guy is infinity. So if you want, the previous result can be said as a subspace of this L infinity hat, which is the way we typically call this space, of uh, where you can say that you have a world, global world postness theory, or at least local. And then this was something that uh, I started with Anna Vargas, and then Alex Gurnock really put it in this, in this framework. And the final result, which is this one, was by Grunrock and Herr, that also includes the periodic uh, case. Uh, the, at the critical level, is essentially the, very much in the spirit of what I have told you so far, is uh, work with Valeria and, uh, and Bravin, and more recently, in a thesis that he will defend in a few weeks, a student of, of Valeria, which is Guguayrenin. Now, about the proof, I have essentially given you all the ingredients except that now I have to guess what is the, 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 the question that Tomá was asking, what is this guy? And of course the lambda m is the same, the rm is, is the same, and now uh, what is the first observation? The first observation is that first you try to understand what is the, the, the dynamics of the action variables. I mean, how, what can you say about the, about the amplitude? And it turns out that this is really nice. So in fact, you can integrate, and this is of course the proof, eh? you can integrate this from one to infinity. Remember that tau changes the direction of time, so you're going from one to infinity. So this is your uh, dynamical system. And then what you can say is that, <coughs> that uh, the, the integral of the right-hand side is, is well-defined at infinity, but of course it's not, uh, Absolutely convergent, so it's an oscillatory integral, and I think this happens also at the at the, Louis, at the usual QEQ NLS. And my impression is that we haven't paid too much attention to this fact because you see, is it is precisely in these oscillations in how so because this is integrable. I'm sorry, I, I need the, the, the next slide. What you can say is that you have a limit, right? So at least you control the modulus of your uh, uh, the guy you are looking for. But once you have uh, this limit, then you do the, the, the previous trick, and you subtract this part, and then you uh, take the leading order, which is the ODE for each J, and then you renormalize, and you see that this guy has a, has a limit. What I am saying is that 
uh, what I think it is very interesting in the dynamics is in which sense this limit is, is, is taken. I mean, what are the fluctuations? And these fluctuations see the, the, this arithmetic function. And this arithmetic function has some, say, stochastic properties which are not the usual ones. They are much closer to, to properties like uh, the one that are called, so this was the selection, this is what I was trying to say. That if, for example, you pick up this example and you try to analyze how are these fluctuations, really you have this typical intermittent phenomena that uh, I guess people say in weak turbulence like. All right, and uh, here, uh, I mean, you can measure things. I'm not saying uh, just uh, waving. Uh, this is not just hand waving. This is what I'm trying to say. So which are the related systems? The related systems are the, the geometric flow of curves in 3D, which is this uh, is the so-called binormal flow. And, and the uh, LIA stands for localized induction approximation. And uh, then uh, the two examples would be that I, first, I start with a curve in 3D that has a corner at times at x equals zero. So this is the corner. So you have two vectors, unit vectors that are not the same. And uh, you have uh, this line on the left, on the right, and this line on the left. This is one of the, uh, of the systems. The, uh, the second example, which is when all the coefficients are the same, if you make the right choice of the CM I was mentioning before, and this is a delicate issue, then what you construct are regular polygons. So you are looking at the evolution of this geometric equation for starting with a regular polygon. And I will show you a, a video in a minute. And that, uh, that you can expect to have a solution for this, guys, is something really not, is something that I would have never expected. But fortunately enough, Valeria called our attention, and we here is uh, De La Oz, our attention of a paper by Gerard and Smets, where they do, I mean, they have theorems, but they do in particular this uh, numerical simulation of the evolution of, uh, uh, of a curve, which is given by a square of a triangle uh, numerically. And, and then you start to believe that you can do math with that. Anyway, so there is another related system, which is now in the physical literature is related to what is called the Heisenberg change or the lambda lipschitz equation, which is the one you obtain by looking at the derivative with respect to x of the, uh, of the curve, the tangent vector, and this is it. You differentiate formally here, you immediately obtain this case. So now we are, we are dealing with guys, this leaves in 3D, this leaves, uh, the target of this is the unit sphere. So I am speaking about systems, and the connection is a very old uh, and beautiful idea by Hashimoto that uh, if you uh, take the evolution of, uh, of the tangent vector and you use, for example, you can just use the frenet frame or the parallel frame, and uh, you call alpha and beta your, your curvatures, you say your geometric quantities, then you build up a complex uh, function that amazingly solves uh, this, this cubic NLS, but with the freedom of gauge. You have the freedom always to, to use this capital A of T, which is the one that allows me to <coughs> to, in a sense, forget about uh, this, uh, uh, this loss of information of the face. All right, so this, uh, this is what I'm trying to say, that the geometric structures implies that the singularities of you are human, are harmless, and the solution can be continued as a geometric object. But, uh, of course, uh, life is not that easy. In fact, there are part of the geometric object that uh, does not uh, survive, which is precisely the frame of the normal vector. And, and this, uh, you have to, uh, there is a blow up. But again, in here, you use modulus, how, how are the beautiful words, modulation in here. And, uh, and then you will be able to, to do your business. Why? Because you, are, you identify the, the asymptotic profile, which is given by uh, SL similar solution. And now, I need to say a few words about the similar solution because this is the, the <coughs> uh, one of the key objects. So the similar solution with respect to scaling uh, will be written in this way. And what it is kind of interesting, something that honestly I don't know why, but this is what happens, is that the simplest way of understanding this, uh, uh, this nonlinear profile is by looking at the Fourier transform. And you have to do a nonlinear change of variable that, of course, is reminiscent of this e to the itc square I, I am modifying all the time. 
So when you do, uh, and, uh, and this is because uh, eventually you are going to deal with the derivative of the tangent, but this is the key guy. I mean, you compute the Fourier transform and you do a nonlinear change of variable, and this is your good unknown, and then you identify what is the, the, the singularity. Is this OD, which is a singular regular equation, very simple, so you have really linearized the problem. Of course, you have also linearized the problem through the net frame, but this is, this is the guy. And <clears throat> this is something in particular I did with the loud. And now your uh, object, which is this is the important object, which is the derivative of the tangent vector. The Fourier transform is nothing but uh, uh, this, uh, uh, say, uh, the solution of this equation evaluated here. In particular, what happens, and this is not easy, uh, this is where the difficulty comes, that the information you have is uh, one part, I mean, because eventually you, in order to continue the solution geometrically, you have to find the information you lose in the phase from somewhere. So this information has to be in the, in the ODE. And uh, it happens that at, time, at, uh, at frequency zero, what you know essentially is the, the say the, the angle of your self-similar solution, the two lines at infinity, but uh, the renormalization of the, of, the, of, the, of the normal vector, I mean the, modul the modulation is an information that you have at infinity, so you have to, to solve the matching problem, right, which is you have say information at zero and I have to tell you precisely what happens at plus infinity, and as you know this happens uh, with very few equations and in, and in part of the literature this is like a hint that you are dealing with a completely integrable system, that in fact it is the case, because the, the cubic NLS is a completely integrable system. But the conclusion of all this is that the Fourier transform, some, for some reason, is, is playing a role. So this is the, uh, the dynamics I was saying. So, well, this, is, uh, this was done by uh, Gerard and Smets, and it was nothing too complicated. He, he, they used a scheme of um, of Batki, which was a very old scheme, and it's in fact uh, just finite differences. And the only thing I wanted to insist is that, amazingly, you go up, end up with the same guy. This is, there is no reason why this should happen. But um, uh, why I think that a similar solution is, uh, is the a universal thing is because, you see, when you close to the singularity, in each corner, what you see, you have to believe me, is the Dessel similar solution. And the Dessel similar solution has the usual two scales of the uh, Schrodinger equation, which is the, the, the one given by the phase, which is uh, self similar, but then you have the other linear scale, which are where the oscillations start to appear. And of course, because you are in a periodic setting, all these waves start to interact and create very complicated things, as the ones that you see here. This is something that uh, De La Othan and I put in the, in the picture, which is to illuminate what is the trajectory of a point, and you see this guy, which is uh, pretty complicated and has, is very famous, is related to the, to the uh, so-called Riemann's non-differentiable function. So now, uh, I guess I am three minutes, okay. So to finish that, uh, really, uh, there are things that ha are happening, which is, uh, so this is kind of a mixture of linear and non-linear. You are, me you are measuring in, the in some kind of equilibrium where most of the dynamics is something that you recognize in the, at the linear level. This is a complicated dynamics that survives even with nonlinear interaction, but there are facts that are not completely linear. And, and, and this is, uh, so, and there is some cascade of energy or some transfer of energy, if you don't want to use so, such a strong word, which is more or less as follows. First of all, the, the natural quantity in T is uh, for the energy is this, and you can read it, write it in the <coughs> as a conservation law. So this is a natural en energy, but uh, uh, I was trying to convince you that uh, you can understand the solution also in Fourier transform side, and it turns out that you can identify this en the energy associated to this guy in the Fourier transform side as a scattering energy. Okay, so. This, the, this is really the energy of the system. You see it in the Fourier transform side when you look far away at a given time in, in frequency. But on the other hand, even, you, even though you have the, the L2 conservation law, there is, uh, there is some growth of uh, is, is L2 in a very precise sense. Eh? So I don't have the time to explain, but anyway, so what happens is really 
uh, the Fourier mode, even if I start with a very nice, as I, I said, I said the, the function uh, V can be very nice, the, the periodic function, so it can be H infinity, so it is not a question that it is not bounding at time one. However, when you look at the Fourier transform and you go to T going to zero, the, the Fourier transform uh, blows up, and this is some kind of, uh, say, transfer of energy, which is complementary to the well-knowns of uh, the I team and and, and Hani Pausader, Svetkov, and Vesilia. So let me finish just with a, few, a simple idea of the proof, because the proof is mainly written in, 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 the, in the Fourier, and with this I finish, okay? So <clears throat> it, is, um, it is written in the Fourier side, and of course here I am going to, to not, not be imprecise, but to, at least to try to convince you where the re new resonance comes from, right? Because it's a mixture of a non-local guy with a local guy. So I start with the equation for the, the Frenet equation. This is Tx is the curvature, but it's better to write it in this way using the, the uh, complex uh, notation. And n is the, the complex vector that uh, tells me how the normal, uh, the coordinates of the normal vector are, are, are changing with time. And uh, of course, it's, this is uh, symplectic because uh, I mean, the, it has to, you have to construct an orthonormal frame. So then remember that u is essentially this guy times a nice function because it is periodic, but it is nice. I mean, it can be as regular. In fact, I have started with just two, two Fourier modes, negative one and one. And it's very simple. It's, uh, well, now we know how to do it in a quite straightforward way to say that t goes to, uh, to two given vectors which are really uh, frozen, okay? So then I can... Uh, so uh, then I, I have to understand, so imagine that you want to understand uh, how is n. What you are saying is that derivative behaves as, a, as a essentially at infinity, because the problem is to make this integral finite at infinity, is a, a given constant times a very well-known guy. So you are going to integrate by parts, right? And this is the role of the different scales in, 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 in the, uh, in the uh, Schrodinger equation, that when you integrate by parts, even though you have here the, the parabolic uh, scaling, when you integrate by parts, you uh, start with, you end up with the hyperbolic scaling. And this is your basic integration by parts, right? So you are going to take good powers of t. Here now t is in between zero and one, so I am in physical space. And, uh, but you have to pay with the distance of x, say, to one of uh, your Fourier modes. So imagine r is going to be one or negative one. So then you are going to plug this into here. Right, so this is what I'm saying. N is going to be essentially uh, this guy times uh, um, what happens close to zero. Uh, this is part of the hand wave, say. But at least it's pretty clear that after integration by parts, you are, this is what you are going to obtain, and it is not so, so simple to say why I can now free, freeze the, the time in zero. Right? But now if I take this in the upper equation, and I wrote what is the, the, the u, then immediately I see that I have created new, new modes, which comes from the difference, the differences of the phases, right? So the new modes are just the differences. So if I only have two modes, then I only will have a new, a new mode, which is the difference, but it comes with a very precise frequency, which is one over t, right? So the, the Fourier transform in this value, x over two t will be as big as this, and of course, x minus r, now uh, this is a key point that because you have more than one Fourier mode, you lose the symmetry from one from left to right. And then even though this was true for, say, uh, in absolute value even, then so that uh, if you integrate, you are going to, be, to have the principal value because you have two corners, then really you have this guy in this region. And when you compute the Fourier coefficient, which is precisely this guy, it will cancel this, cancel, uh, this phase and you have to integrate one over x, which gives you a log, all right? So this is the picture, and with this I finished. So you, I have the two corners. Then because of the uh, self-similar solution, I know that nothing happens in the self-similar region, square root of t, but uh, as soon as I'm far there, they, I have a start to see all these oscillations you saw in the picture. And they start to interact each other, and then at scale t, you start to have new modes that do not decay too fast, and eventually give you a logarithmic correction. And uh, so let me just uh, 
go to the last one. Okay, it's clear what is there, right? <laughs> so that's all, huh? <laughs> So thank you, Luis. Uh, are there some questions or remarks? So you started with regular polygon, but if you have irregular polygon. Uh, well, uh, that's, uh, we have no idea. We, even with a regular <coughs> polygon, what the only thing we have is the candidate to the solution. So the example two is just we say this is a solution in a, in a very, say, very weak way. And then uh, what we know is that these candidates, when I put it in the computer and I look at the polygons that happens at rational times, fit with the evolution. But we don't even know how to construct the curve for irrational times. So this is, I mean, this is, we are working on that, but this is, I mean, because all these Fourier series, I mean, it's, mu it's much harder than to deal with the Riemann's function. Riemann's function at the end is uh, absolutely integrable. And all these Talbot effect, I mean, there are very, there's quite a few experts here on this Talbot effect. This, uh, it took quite a long time to understand the uh, Riemann's function. And, uh, and, uh, and so now it's understood, but the, gu the guy we have to deal with for constructing the, the, the curve for irrational times, it has one less derivative. So the Riemann's function is one over j square, and the one you have to deal with is one over j. So it's, it's much more delicate. And of course, you have to, to solve Frenet frame for that. So this is very much in the rough, uh, very rough uh, path. Things. But here you, you have a very good description in terms of Fourier series of what it is your uh, your uh, curvature and torsion. So then your question is now what happens if I have a, say something like this, right? Uh, we of course you can do numerical experiments and then you see that essentially you can superpose. This is the reason why I think that the regular polygons are kind of universal. Because it's like you have two different periods. One is this, and the other one is this one. So you will generate like uh, one for one period, the another solution for the other period, and then you have to look at the interaction, like if you would have two, two solitons. Right? So this quite likely could, can be doable, but, uh, but not yet. Other questions? <laughs> there is one comment, a real question. Uh -huh. okay. uh, the comment is about the solution EA. When you look at it in self linear variable, it's a periodic solution. Uh, what do you mean by self similar variables? Uh, I don't know. It is uh, x by x over square root of t. And uh, well, it is not periodic. It's e, it's e to the i x square. It is not pretty. This is the point that, uh, say, the kind of strange behavior that is happening is that you are making. If you look at the time, also, you have a PIS squared, and you have a PIS. It's periodic. It's a similar solution. I don't know. I would say no. Okay. No, because you have a time, also. Okay, so we will explain later because I don't think I'm understanding you. Yeah. And uh, a second question, sorry for this stupid question, but what happens in higher dimension? Because it seems that uh, I would say, I, I, I guess that uh, maybe Daniel is uh, agree with this. This is uh, the difficulty here is, is one dimension. If you look at, uh, of course, what happens in higher dimensions, you can, I'm not saying that the higher dimensions are easier. I mean, the Schrodinger maps, these people know, <laughs> in 2D was, was really a tour de force. But uh, I'm speaking about something which is critical and, and also about, some, uh, and to understand this long range scattering. And uh, as far as I know, this is a basic question that we don't understand yet. We don't have a good threshold uh, theorem of when you have a scattering and when you don't have, for example, all these solutions uh, are huge, so they are not small. And in a sense, all the behavior is the one of the long range scattering. 
And this is because I am using the conformal transformation that kills the solitons, of course. But uh, the, for me, this is not clarified at all. So definitely, higher D is very interesting, but <laughs> I mean, I have enough job here. Huh? <laughs> to, many things to do here. So, yeah. Okay, uh, no more questions. Thank you again. Yeah.